Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy. As we continue our study in Paul's epistle, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 11 in a message I'm entitling Defenses Against Dangers. When I read this particular passage and began to pray and prepare for it, it was hard for me not to think about a very famous book written by Charles Haddon Spurgeon that was entitled Lectures to My Students. He was perhaps the first pastor of a megachurch. And as you can imagine, in his church, it drew literally thousands of men and women. And he started a pastoral school. And in it, he described what it meant to be a good servant, a good minister. And in this particular passage, that's exactly what Timothy is going to be instructed in, what it means to be a good servant, what it means to be a good minister. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we're so grateful for Jesus. Lord, we come, we sing. Lord, even as we were worshiping and we sang the song, My One Defense, My Righteousness, Lord, how we need you. Lord, it's our desire not to bring you shame, but to bring you honor. Not to misrepresent you, but to bring you glory. And so, Heavenly Father, again, we pray that as men and women, that we would long not simply to know you and love you, but to serve you in the most tangible way possible. That we could reflect your heart that we could reveal your care and your concern for people. Lord, as we declare with power and from experience that you are in the business of forgiving sinners and reconciling them to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. First Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, Paul, writing to Timothy, says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you've carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe these things command and teach. Paul has provided Timothy with a description of the dangers that the men and women faced, the church faced in Ephesus in chapters one through five, excuse me, in verses one through five of the chapter. And now Paul's going to encourage Timothy in some possible defenses against those dangers in verses six through 11. The dangers included the coming apostasy. Remember the apostasy is a falling away from the truth. Paul writes about that apostasy elsewhere in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Also the Holy Spirit's warnings that satanic spirits would energize, influence false teachers, denying basic essential Christian teaching, and that those false teachings would then provide an excuse for people to begin their lives to live their lives 
in ways that are dishonoring and displeasing to God. We might think of this, that false teaching inevitably leads to false living. And one of the sure signs of a false teacher and a false teaching is that they'll preach moral purity and practice moral failure. They're hypocrites. They're hardened in their heart. They're seared in their conscience, willing to abandon Christian teaching. The dangerous false teachers read the Bible and then explain away its content. So what are the countermeasures? And by the way, countermeasure is a wonderful word. It, it means an act or a plan to avoid danger, to stop or reduce injury. If you've ever been in the service and, or you've ever seen movies about naval ships and naval battles or flight, when they're engaged in battle, they'll initiate countermeasures when the ship is at risk or when the army is at risk. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about here. How do we defend against false teachers and false teaching? Again, Paul's answer to Timothy is the word of God and prayer. Remember what it says in verse 5, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The whole point being that it should be the word of God that settles the issue. When there is a dispute, when there's a problem, when there's a difficulty, when there's whatever happens to be going on, it should be the Bible that offers us the ability to both define the problem and then resolve the conflict. Remember, the false teachers were teaching social and cultural restrictions. Don't marry food prohibitions, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth in verse 3. So for servants in the church, this passage, verses 6 through 11, and then the passages that follow, verses 12 through 16, are going to provide a kind of a list of do's and don'ts for the good minister, for the servant. And we're going to discover that we're not to waste our time arguing over foolish ideas and silly myths in verse 7. Later, Paul will remind Timothy that he mustn't allow his youth to intimidate or dissuade him from Christ's commands and instructions in verse 12 or neglect the spiritual gift that has been given to him by God through prayer and the Holy Spirit in verse 14. And so for the person who's asking the question, I wonder what it would be like to be a good minister. The word itself is problematic because in our culture and society, we often think of a minister as the person who preaches from the pulpit or who pastors the church. I mean, when somebody says, are you a minister? You go, oh no, I'm just a regular person. But in the Bible, when it's using the term minister, it means servant. And so, in the context of service, we are all ministers. We're servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what does this mean? What will it take to be a good servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing you need to learn is how to feed yourself in verse 6. So in verse 6, Paul tells Timothy, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. You'll note when it says, if you instruct, in the NIV it says, if you point out. In the Old King James it says, put in remembrance. The Greek word is very, very interesting because it literally means to place under or to lay down. And so the reference in these things must include minimum what Paul has said in verses 1 through 5. In verses 1 through 5, remember he talked about 
the Spirit speaking expressly that in the latter times there would come, come uh, deceiving spirits, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisies. These things is a reference to the false teachers and their false teaching. But I'm going to suggest to you that it probably means everything that Paul has written in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and also chapter 4. The idea being that Timothy has been well taught and he's been nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine which you had carefully followed. The idea being Timothy faithfully followed the good teaching of Paul. In the early church, I can't even begin to tell you how much they emphasized not just right teaching, but right living. All of the early documents, both in the New Testament and the early church fathers, few things had more preoccupation than it's not good enough to just simply believe this. Please live it. Please live your life as if this is true. And so now Timothy was to faithfully impart what was faithfully entrusted to him. And we've already talked about that, that you're to faithfully impart what's been faithfully entrusted to you. You're to speak to your children and your grandchildren, your brothers and your sisters, the people you come in contact with. Paul belonged to this first generation of apostles and teachers. Timothy belonged to a second generation. So the gospel and the message relies on the faithfulness of each generation. Each generation has to be able to impart what has been given to them. It was Billy Graham who said, God hasn't called me to preach to the generation that went before me. He hasn't called me to preach to the generation that comes after me. He's called me to preach to this generation. And that's exactly right. He didn't feel the need to look deep into the past or far into the future. There's plenty of people who need the gospel right at this very moment. And so the good minister of Jesus Christ instructs the brethren carefully about the dangers of the false teachers and the false teaching. But the good servant, the good minister also exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to point people to Jesus, to remind people about Jesus. The invisible, supernatural Holy Spirit is always pointing people to Christ. And so the good servant, the good minister, faithfully teaches nourishing food healthy food, sound doctrine. For those of you who've been with me since the beginning of this particular epistle, if you go all the way back to Timothy, the opening chapter, the 10th verse, remember it says for fornicators, sodomites, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, he uses the term hygienia. You know that word, it's hygiene. It means clean. It means pure. It means healthy. And so what Paul has talked about in chapter 1, verse 10, and now again he's talking about the sound doctrine in chapter 4, he's talking about healthy, clean, that which promotes spiritual health. And so the good minister of Jesus feeds on the word of God. So that he or she can feed others. You see, the truth is, you can't be a good minister. You won't be a faithful servant. Able to impart good, healthy teaching. Unless you're a, a student of the Bible. If ever you wanted to be a teacher of the Bible. If ever you have to be a student of the Bible. And I've told you repeatedly, if you want to know the Bible, teach the Bible. Find someone who knows less than you do. And the chances are you're going to discover some amazing things. 
So what is the suitable, healthy diet for the servant? Look what the text says. Words of faith, good doctrine, carefully followed. Isn't that good? It isn't just words of faith that you learn, good doctrine that you learn, but that you follow. And so Paul says, avoid foolish speculations. Look what it says in verse 7, but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. So in the do's and the don't, the, the do's and the don'ts, the part of the do's is avoid foolish speculations. Part of the Part of the do's is, uh, is, is promote godliness. So what does Paul mean when he says reject profane and old wives fables? Now, pause where you are in the text. Paul has said good food makes for good health. The metaphor, of course, is spiritual food makes for good spiritual health. Poisonous food is a recipe for physical illness. I backslid a few days ago. I went to McDonald's. I got a sausage biscuit. It was so yummy. But it's like poison. It was like poison for my body. If you want to be healthy, you're going to have to eat healthy. And if you want to be spiritual healthy, then you've got to eat spiritually healthy food. Unhealthy doctrine promotes spiritual illness. That makes sense to you, I hope. Healthy doctrine promotes spiritual health. Unhealthy doctrine promotes spiritual illness. And so what Paul is in effect telling Timothy is... Avoid spiritual nonsense. Promote godliness. Spiritual nonsense distracts us from healthy objectives. And by the way, that word, profane, it's an adjective. Bibalos. It occurs five times in the Greek New Testament. Twice, it's a reference to a person. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16. Three times it describes to something. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Again in chapter 6, verse 20. And then in the second epistle, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. In every case, it's translated profane in the King James Version. Some scholars suggest in this sense the word is the opposite of sacred. Which would then mean worldly. In reference to people, it seems to mean godless, irreligious, people who are absent piety. And when I mean piety, I mean religious disciplines of going to church or reading a Bible, or having God as a part of your conversation. The Latin equivalent of this word was profanus. You probably know that word. It's a part of the, this word that's translated l literally across the board from Latin. Pro means before. Fanum in Latin was the temple. And so... In that culture and society, in the Roman world of the first century, it meant outside the temple or to step away from the sacred, hieros. And so it came to mean a number of different things. In the Old Testament, it came to mean religious ritual. But here, profane isn't simply the absence of the sacred. Here, it probably means anything that leaves God out. And so, in our culture, in our society, imagine a place where they go, this is a God-free zone. Does anything come to your mind? Go ahead, anybody. Pretend this is a Pentecostal church and you can talk to me. Government, leave religion out. Leave God out. 
Any, anything else you can think of? Schools. Work. Work. Leave God out of the schools. Leave God out of the government. Leave God out. Leave God out. Leave God out. But for you as a Christian, guess what? There is no such thing as a profane place. There is no such place in your life or in your thinking. When the Bible says you're a Christian, God is in your home. God is in your work. God is in your thinking. God is in your entertainment. God is in your education. God is everywhere. And so when he says, but reject profane, what he's basically saying is reject those places, those sources, those things that invite you to consider life, thinking, philosophy, absent God. And I'm going to suggest something else. Some scholars believe that Paul is making a reference almost certainly to the Gnostic teachings which had invaded Ephesus and permeated the church and made its way into the church because in that sense, it's the Gnostic teaching that's scornfully described as profane and unholy, mythoi, worldly. And so again, remember in the Gnostic way of thinking, all matter was evil and all spirit was good. And so in their way of thinking, you couldn't eat a meal to the glory of God. You couldn't exercise joy to the glory of God in a material setting because in their worldview, it was absolutely unsacred. I suspect it means all the wild and foolish speculations that attempt to explain things apart from God and apart from the Bible and apart from Jesus and apart from the cross of Calvary. And so in this kind of way of thinking, that means that evolution is an old wives fable, profane. In other words, it's an offering and an explanation of reality Apart from God, secular scientists, profane scientists will say, you can't let God into the door. Why? Well, the moment that you accept a supernatural uh, premise, then you can't do real science. And what I'm here to tell you is you can't do real science unless you have a biblical worldview. Because philosophical naturalism does not explain everything that you see. You know what Paul is trying to get us to understand? There are people who love spiritual nonsense. They love to preoccupy themselves with things that don't matter. Paul calls on us to reject profane and old wives' fables. By that, I think he's saying false teachings. But I think he's saying more. The Amplified New Testament uses the expression irreverent legends profane and impure godless fictions, mere grandmother tales, and silly myths, unquote. So the good minister rejects all false teachings, which are nothing more than frivolous speculations and false notions of men. So what else might this include? Fables, superstitions, speculations. Paul is in effect saying, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. Paul uses the word gymnazo when he says in verse seven, but reject profane and old wives fables and exercise. That's the word gymnazo. It's a verb. You probably know what that means. We get the word gymnasium from it. 
So you go to the, so one is a verb and one is a noun. Exercise is what you do. Gymnasium is the place where you go in order to do what you do. So what is he saying? He uses the verb in verse seven. He uses the noun in verse eight, gymnasium. And by the way, the root word gymnast, do you know what it means? Naked. Naked. Do you know why? In that culture and society, in the Greek world of the third century and the second century, when they would exercise, they would take all of their clothes off. And so it came to me, they, so when you would exercise, the word itself came to mean to engage in physical activities or bodily exercises. And so in verse 8, when Paul says, exercise yourself to godliness, again, for the literalist, he's not saying get naked. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about the activity that leads to godly behavior. And so in verse 8, when he says, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come, what he is basically saying is that there is value in bodily exercise. The text doesn't say no value, but it also doesn't give us the right to say enormous profit. Now let's be clear here. Does it make good sense to exercise and eat right? Yes. Can exercise become an obsession? Yes. Can food become an obsession? Yes. Christians are to avoid obsessions. But here's the point that he's making. The point that he's making is that both physical exercise and spiritual exercise require effort and exertion. So the reference isn't simply a metaphor for the physical activity of exercise, but more likely the point that Paul is making is that the disciplined training that is involved for the Christian worker is going to take effort. A workout is a workout, but training is the discipline of working out on a regular basis. And if any of you have ever worked out on a regular basis, or if any of you have ever been involved in athletics, when I was a, a, from a very small age as a kid, I would play sports. In junior high school and high school, I would play sports. I would play football and I wrestled and um, there was times in my life where I played basketball and ran track at the varsity level. And when you go from the varsity level in high school to the college level, there's an intensity of requirement to train at a particular level. So what is the point that he's making? The point that he's making is that just like the athlete has to physically commit to a regimen in order for you to exercise spiritual godliness, you can't just wait around and go, hey God, when is the Holy Spirit going to make me godly? When's the Holy Spirit going to wake me up so that I can pray in the morning? When's the Holy Spirit going to wake me up so that I'll read my Bible? When is the Holy Spirit going to motivate me to share my faith? Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit is willing to do all of that. But at some point, you're going to have to actually get up. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to read your Bible. It takes effort to do these things. It takes effort to go to church. It takes effort to exercise your spiritual gifts. So Paul says, having the promise of the life that now is and, and that of which is to come. He, he basically says there is a temporal benefit for godliness and there's an eternal benefit for godliness. But it probably behooves us, at least for a moment, to ask and answer a new question. What is godliness? What does Paul mean by godliness? I think it means both a right attitude about God and towards God, 
and then a proper response to God. In other words, godliness, track with me for a moment. Godliness is having a right attitude about God. Having the right thoughts, ideas, impressions about God. It's a willingness to approach God and then respond to God. In what way? Because as you begin to think about God and respond to God and see the God that's revealed in the Bible and the person of Jesus Christ, and you begin to ask and answer the question, what kind of a God is God? God is a personal God, a loving God, a good God who wants to walk with you and be with you and communicate with you. And the Bible clearly says that God has revealed himself in his word and then he's revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So if godliness means thinking right thoughts about God, approaching God in the right way, and then living your life based on what you know the Bible says about God, now you begin to understand it. And so that that all-inclusive language, our response to God. Now we might, some, the, the purists might argue, well, we could respond to God in rebellion and disobedience. That's not the kind of, that's not godly. So whatever it means to respond to God based on the revelation of God, is God the kind of God that he wants you to respond in rebellion and disobedience or submission and obedience? That's godliness. And by the way, Paul's already spoken about godliness in chapter 2, verse 2, in chapter 3, verse 16, and once again in chapter 4. So godliness includes right thinking, right living. And again, it was incredibly, it was incredibly, it was incredibly important to the people in the early church that their lives reflected what they really believed about Jesus. And this is a huge problem, I think. And the reason why I think it's a huge problem, not in the early church, but in, the, in this church, and I don't mean Calvary, South Denver, but I mean in the church of Jesus Christ in the world, is that there are so many people who are looking for reasons to excuse bad behavior. To find all, you know, everybody's a sinner and everybody messes up. And it's true that everybody's a sinner. And it is true that everybody messes up. But at what point, at what point, at what point as a, as a Christian culture are we going to value separation from sin? And walking with the Lord. We practice the word of the Lord. So now I want you to think about this again. Because Paul's point to Timothy and to us. False teaching, false teachers often provided an excuse for ungodly living. And that's what he wants to avoid. So we train. And we discipline ourselves now. So that we could have the current benefits in this world and in the world to come. And so he says, exercise yourself towards godliness. Cultivate reason and purpose in verse 9. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. So what is the faithful saying that's worthy of all acceptance? Again, scholars say, is he making a reference to what he just said? Or is he now introducing us to something that he's going to say? My safe answer is going to be maybe both. All that Paul is saying. He's not suggesting that, hey, everything that I've said thus far, just ignore that. Now we're moving on to something new. I think what he's suggesting is everything that I've said thus far and everything that I'm about to say his instructions about false teachers. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. What he said about the false teachers in verse 5. What he said about exalting Jesus in verse 6. What he said about nourishing ourselves and others in Christian teaching and faith in verse 6. Avoiding foolish and frivolous speculations in verse 7. Understanding and exercising spiritual disciplines that lead to godly Christ-like character in verse 8. So the good minister 
And here's probably the key. The good minister. The good servant. Accepts what Paul says is trustworthy. Now this goes to the heart of something else. Because there are people who don't want to serve the Lord and they don't want to serve Jesus. And so they'll pit Paul against Jesus or the rest of the Bible. They'll say stuff like, well, you know, Paul said that and you can't trust what Paul said. Do you know what Paul is saying in this sentence? He's saying in this sentence, I'm trustworthy. You can trust what I'm saying. I want you to pause for a moment and just consider that great big idea. Luke, the doctor, wrote the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts, which constitutes one third of the New Testament. 33% of the entire New Testament is comprised in those two books. Do you realize that Paul wrote one fourth of the New Testament? But he influences Luke, who writes one third of the New Testament. Why am I saying all of this? I'm saying all of this because Paul is basically reminding any single person who would say, Paul can't be trusted, to no, Paul can be trusted. Is Paul's teachings are his instructions trustworthy? That's the question. And of course, Paul might be excused if he says, of course he's going to say that his instructions are, are worth heeding. But Peter will later say concerning Paul, that, that his sayings can be trusted. Paul, Paul's instructions deserve respect and acceptance. The respect and acceptance come from Luke, who writes both Luke and Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Peter. So the good minister, the good servant, gives instructions and so Paul's instructions deserve respect and acceptance. And the good minister thinks, considers, and then commits his or her life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. They're willing to live their lives for Jesus and they're willing to live their lives for others. And so what this basically reminds us is that this is the very definition of purpose. The very definition of purpose is why am I alive? Why do I exist? And the Bible's answer is you are alive and you exist to glorify God. You are alive and you exist to bring him glory and bring him honor and to bring him praise and to walk with him in sincere friendship and fellowship and then to cultivate the gifts that he's given you in order order to do what God has called you to do. And so when Paul says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, he says the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15 that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Later Paul <clears throat> writes to Timothy in chapter 2, verse 11, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we're going to live with him. If we endure, we're going to reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he can't deny himself. So when Paul uses that term, that this is a faithful saying, it should provide for you a compass, a way of providing direction for yourself. When you lose your way, when you, when you lose your way and you don't know exactly where you are and exactly where you need to be, Paul, when he uses this expression, that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that you can find your way back to the place where you need to be. And for some of you, that might be because you stumble, you fall, you make a mistake, you get off track, and you need to find your way back to a right relationship with God and Christ. 
And that's what Paul is talking about. And then work hard and bear unjust criticism. In verse 10, it says, For the, to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. And when he says, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, Paul is pointing out that we're to work hard. The word labor here means to break a sweat. Have you ever had a job where you go, easy peasy? This, this is like nothing. This is so easy. But maybe you've had a job where you really had to work. And all of a sudden, your armpits start pouring water. Your face starts pouring water. Every pore in your body starts pouring water. And you start to feel physically stretched to the limit. That's actually what he's talking about. He's talking about hard labor. And again, remember, to this end we both labor and suffer reproach. To what end? He's a good minister. He's working faithfully for Jesus. This isn't something that you do just simply on Sunday mornings. This isn't just something that you do on Wednesday nights. It's where you wake up in the morning and you live your life and each and every day serves as a platform for you to love him and walk with him and serve him. We work to the point of fatigue and exhaustion. We labor. We give until we're spent. We exert every effort. We spend every resource for the sake of God and Christ and the gospel. And yes, godliness. And as a result, we're working and willing to bear reproach and criticism or misunderstanding, ridicule and mocking. When you begin to walk with Jesus as a full-time occupation, there's going to be people who are going to say, you're... You're off. The, you're okay. You're a Jesus freak now. You know, going to church on Sunday. I get that. Going to church on Wednesday. They roll their eyes. But if you love Him, and serve Him, and walk with Him, morning, noon, night. Loving, serving, walking, loving, serving, walking. It's going to take commitment. Discipleship is training. Like a soldier, you have to prepare for resistance. My son is a captain in the army. He has a plaque in his office. The plaque that he looks at every single day as a soldier. It says, make sure that you are the hardest person in the room to kill. He lives his life that way. He's a soldier. And because he's a soldier, he knows that God has called him to the uncomfortable possibility that sometime, at some point in his not too distant future life, he might have to kill people. But in order to be a good soldier, you have to make sure that you don't get killed. And it requires vigorous, disciplined training. And if you don't want to lose your spiritual life in this world in which we live, then it's going to require... Remember, in order for you to be a good minister, a good servant, in order to impart good food for health and service, that means you're going to have to know what's right, and you're going to have to be able to resist what's wrong. The soldier prepares for war. The soldier must defeat or kill the enemy. The athlete competes for the prize. And depending on the level of competition, that's going to bring out the level of training. And training means, among other things, that life gets set aside. Do you remember when you played sports? You had to set aside certain things in order to participate in that sport. 
A soldier has to set aside certain things in order to be a disciplined combatant. And there's a bit of textual controversy surrounding this verse. The majority of the medieval manuscripts translates a Greek word. Interestingly, it says, for to this end we both labor and suffer reproach. The majority, basically, I don't need to give you the big long Greek word, but some scholars seem to think that it makes more sense that it's, they sound so much alike. It's onidizometha versus agonizometha. For the, for the purist, what, what it basically means, the, the Greek word agonizo is a, is a word that was used in athletic competitions in the ancient world, which means that you train and discipline to the point where it hurts. It's what people say in the gym today, no pain, no gain. You feel the fire in your muscles. You feel the fire burning. And so if it means, it, it's, gonna, it, it's translated one of two ways. It either means labor and suffer reproach, or it means toil and struggle, or it means labor and strife. The most important thing about even bringing this up is that either meaning, whether it means burden, labor, reproach, toil, struggle, whatever the meaning of this text is, it means that you're to do it. Deliberately, specifically, pointedly. We're willing to bear criticism. We're wi willing to bear ridicule. We're willing to bear rebu rebuke. Now think about it again. When you live in a world that is profane, absent God, and all of the things that we just talked about, if you go into a school and they say, this is a God-free zone, and you bring up God in school, what will you suffer? Ridicule. You go in government service. You bring up God. This is a God-free zone. We don't talk about God. You go to work. This is a God-free zone. We don't talk about God. So the moment you decide to live your life in Christ, not just simply in your home, not just simply in your marriage, not just simply in your relationship, but in every aspect of your life, are you going to invite ridicule, criticism, and mockery? I think the answer is yes. So that's the point. We do this because our word and our work are based on the truth. That's what he's saying. He basically says also, For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men. Now, I want you to think about this. Because Paul says, because we trust in the living God, we don't trust in dead men philosophy. We don't necessarily trust in man's ideas or man's opinions about ultimate issues. And so I think that that's part of the point that he's making. Also, when he says the savior of all men, that doesn't mean universalism. It doesn't mean that Jesus is the savior of everyone and that you get to be saved apart from God, apart from Christ, apart from salvation. The scripture never imposes salvation on anyone. There are certain people who say, Guess what? You're saved whether you like it or not. You're going to heaven whether you like it or not. You're a Christian whether you like it or not. And you say, sorry, this isn't Islam. It isn't you convert or we cut your head off. You can't be a Christian any other way than voluntarily. Because you make a decision in your heart to love him and serve him. The scriptures never impose salvation on anyone. And you're not saved or damned because you were always saved or damned. You're not condemned to die in your sins. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to spend eternity apart from God. You can be reconciled to God. That's the point that he is making. So we toil, we struggle, 
we labor, we exercise godliness, we confront and instruct in verse 11. Look what it says, these things command and teach. We're to be good ministers, servants. The good minister commands and teaches these things. Now, I want you to think about it. Command and teach what? Resist false teachers and false teaching. Promote healthy teaching and healthy doctrine. The good minister teaches what Paul has said. We confront error. We conf provide instruction in the truth. We do it with boldness, courage, conviction. And again, if you command and teach, could it invite opposition? We know that it will. So in the early church, character and conduct mattered. Cyprian of Carthage said, quote, when appointing priests, we should choose only those of spotless and upright character as our leaders, unquote. Can you imagine if that was posted at the Democratic National Convention and the Republican National Convention? We choose only those of spotless and upright character as our leaders. And I know what all of you are thinking. That ship has sailed. That ship has sailed. But guess what? We as Christians have a different standard. One early journal of instruction called the Didache said, quote, appoint bishops and deacons worthy of the Lord, mild men who are not out to get money, men who are genuine and approved, for they should be your prophets and your teachers. Do you want to be a good minister? Do you want to be a good servant? Number one, learn to instruct yourself in order to feed others. Do you want to be a good servant? Know the Bible for yourself. Read it for yourself. Understand it for yourself. Be able to not only know it for yourself, but be, so that you can instruct others. Exalt Jesus. Do you want to be a good minister? Discourage spiritual nonsense. Do you want to be a good minister? Shape up. Exercise godliness. Read God's word. Apply God's word. Seek fellowship. Pray. Serve. Give. And godliness has double benefits. It will serve you here. And it will serve you there. Do you want to be a good minister? Then remember, godliness requires work and effort. You won't be godly by simply showing up for church. You won't be godly by going to Wednesday night services. You won't be godly by simply serving in a particular place at a particular time. Godliness is going to require a lifestyle of commitment and discipline. And why do we do it? We don't do it in order to get saved. We do it because we are saved. That's the point that Paul is making. Because it's the word of God that provides our authority, instruction, guidance, purpose, and everything that we do. And by the way, Paul isn't done. Paul is going to encourage Timothy to be an example to other believers in verse 12. To devote himself not simply to private reflection, but public worship in verse 13. To not neglect his spiritual gift in verse 14. To wholly give himself to the admonitions and instructions that are provided in the Bible in verse 15. But that's what we're going to talk about the next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Lord, we... so do want to be good servants, good ministers. Lord, we want to discourage things that are unhealthy and encourage the things that are healthy. And so, Heavenly Father, again, we pray, we pray, we pray that, Lord, we would be men and women who want to 
understand and be reminded of what's right, of what's true, of what's good, of what's decent, of what's honest. That, Lord, we want to be aware of what the gospel is so that we can share it. So that it's second nature for us to say human beings have a problem with sin. God's provided us with a savior. A real Jesus has come into the world. We can be forgiven instead of remain estranged from God. Our hearts can be cleansed. We can walk in obedience and submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We can grow, we can mature, we can be different. Our lives can be different, our families can be different, our church could be different. And so again, Lord, we thank you for this great privilege that we have and for the instructions that Paul gives to Timothy and so gives to us. And so again, Lord, grow us up in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Mm -hmm.